Israel is being accused of committing genocide in the UN's top court. And now that we have a preliminary ruling from the court, it's raised a lot of questions. I've talked to some experts to try to help answer 10 of the biggest ones. So let's start with the basics. What is this case about? This case is being tried in the International Court of Justice, which is the UN's main judicial body. It's often referred to as the World Court. It is the, the pinnacle court in the international legal system. It's basically where countries can take each other to court. This particular case is between Israel and South Africa and will be decided by 17 judges from around the world. South Africa says Israel's military operation in Gaza breaches the 1948 Genocide Convention and has a genocidal intent against Palestinians. In its argument, it refers to things like the high number of Palestinians killed, the displacement of the vast majority of the population, the restriction of aid, the attacks on healthcare workers and hospitals, and public statements made by Israeli officials inciting genocide. Israel, meanwhile, argues that it has the right to defend itself and says, although the civilian suffering in Gaza is tragic, its military operation is following international humanitarian law, and that its true intent shouldn't be taken from what it says are random quotes, but from official government policy and statements made by its leaders, which it says demonstrate the opposite of genocidal intent. For example, the Prime Minister repeating that Israel is targeting Hamas and not the civilian population. Question number two, why is South Africa involved? Because of the seriousness of genocide, any state that recognises the Genocide Convention can bring charges to the ICJ, even if they're not directly involved. And South Africa has a long history of supporting the Palestinian people. However, experts say the likely reason why South Africa decided to take the lead in this case was to avoid any legal complications that may have slowed things down. Palestine has brought a case to the ICJ before and recognises the Genocide Convention, but it's not a fully-fledged member of the UN and is not recognised by Israel as a state, which many experts speculate would have resulted in Israel refusing to participate in the case. Israel simply wouldn't have shown up had Palestine brought the case. Now, why has a ruling already been made? Cases like this can take years to reach a final ruling. So in the meantime, South Africa requested what are known as provisional measures. These are basically emergency orders that the court can hand out to stop a situation from getting worse while a case unfolds. South Africa's main request was asking the court to order Israel to stop its military operations in Gaza. In other words, to order an immediate ceasefire. It just says, look, there's a risk here that if we don't step in and make these emergency measures, things will get so much worse that our eventual judgment won't have any effect at all. Israel, on the other hand, requested that the court dismiss the case altogether. The ruling that we've just received has to do with these specific requests and is only an interim ruling. It's not a ruling on whether or not Israel is committing genocide. Like I said, a final ruling on that is still a long way away. Just as a quick side note, the reason why this case is solely focused on accusations of genocide and not accusations of war crimes, for example, is because war crimes are outside of the jurisdiction of the ICJ. War crimes are defined by the UN as violations of international humanitarian law that incur individual criminal responsibility. The ICJ is not a criminal court, and it's set up for disputes between states, not individuals. Charging an individual with a war crime is something that's usually handled by the International Criminal Court, which is a completely different organisation that follows a completely different legal process. So, what was the interim ruling? The ICJ denied Israel's request to dismiss the case. It accepts South Africa's arguments that there's a plausible case that genocide has occurred and may be occurring right now. It also granted most of South Africa's requests, except for its main one ordering an immediate ceasefire. Instead, the court has ordered Israel to do everything it can to prevent acts of genocide, as well as stopping comments that may incite genocide. Israel has also been ordered to make sure that civilians in Gaza are provided with basic services and the humanitarian aid they urgently need. Plus, Israel must report back to the court within a month 
to demonstrate that it's been following these court orders. The ICJ judges voted overwhelmingly in favour of most of South Africa's requests. So why didn't the court also order a ceasefire? One of the main theories posed by a number of legal experts is that even if the court wanted to... It just doesn't necessarily have jurisdiction to order a full ceasefire. Not just because of how narrow the focus of South Africa's case is, but because the court doesn't actually have jurisdiction over Hamas, because Hamas isn't a state. So the court can't actually order a ceasefire because it can only order one side to stop fighting. Which would have raised the issue of uh, what impact that would have had upon Israel's inherent right to self-defense. For example, in its ruling, the ICJ called for Hamas to release its hostages, but it can't actually order it to. And this brings us to the next question. Why isn't Hamas also before the court? Like I said, the ICJ is only for disputes between states, and Hamas isn't a state. Charging an individual with genocide or a war crime is something that's handled by the ICC. This is also why it's the state of Israel before the ICJ and not specific leaders in Israel. So what is the punishment for genocide at the ICJ? The short answer to this is not much, because the ICJ isn't a criminal court like the ICC. Usually the court's orders are declaratory, so that means that they state the law and don't go any further than that. For example, in the 90s, Serbia was ruled to have failed to prevent genocide occurring in the town of Srebrenica, which is the only time a breach of the Genocide Convention has been found at the ICJ. The result of that ruling was basically stating what the breach was, ordering Serbia to follow the convention in future, and to cooperate with cases involving individuals accused of genocide. The court can also order a country to pay reparations, but an important wrinkle to all of this is that even though ICJ rulings are binding and can't be appealed, the court doesn't actually have any power to enforce anything and relies on countries acting in good faith. For example, in 2022, the court ordered Russia to stop its military operation in Ukraine, which Russia basically ignored. If an order is ignored, the UN Security Council can be asked to intervene, but even the Security Council's powers are limited, because any of its permanent members, like Russia or the United States, can veto any decision. And even when the Council has agreed to support an ICJ ruling, as it did in 1993 for example, its resolution failed to prevent the Srebrenica massacre just two years later. The fact that the ICJ mostly just states what the law is and can't actually enforce anything often leads people to asking, what's the point of the ICJ? Experts say, for the most part, countries do respect the decisions of the court, and defying its orders can lead to reputational damage, sanctions, and international isolation. Rulings also help to shape and influence international opinion and future decision making. It creates this historical record. You have a set of facts which are essentially indisputable because a third party neutral decision maker has looked at the evidence from both sides. Plus, emergency orders from the court can help to de-escalate worsening situations, which is what experts hope will happen in Gaza after this ruling. The court was very clear to emphasise the need for ensuring that this doesn't get any worse. They called it a catastrophe. And this brings us to the final question. What does all of this mean for the people of Gaza? In the week following the ruling, according to Gaza's Ministry of Health, more than a thousand Palestinians were killed. And more recently, a top UN official has accused Israel of already breaching the ICJ's orders. South Africa has even made another urgent request to the court in what experts say is an attempt to halt Israel's ground invasion of Rafah a city in the south of Gaza where more than a million Palestinians have fled since the start of the war. Israel maintains that it's following international humanitarian law, as it says it has been this entire time. Mediating countries are still hopeful that a ceasefire deal can be reached, but Israeli PM Benjamin Netanyahu says Israel's military operation in Gaza won't end until it eliminates Hamas. Many experts say the most concrete order by the court that may lead to some change is the one relating to humanitarian aid. However, in recent days, UN officials have reported the healthcare situation in Gaza is still extremely precarious and that the risk of famine is increasing day by day. 
Beyond that, experts say, at the very least, Israel will be aware that its actions in Gaza are now under an even greater microscope. Also, that this ruling may make Israel's allies reassess how they're supporting this military operation. There's also the possibility of states which are supplying Israel with military aid, for example. They're at risk now of um, being found to have aided or abetted an internationally wrongful act. The bottom line here is that we'll have a better understanding of just how much of an impact this ruling has actually made by the time Israel has been ordered to report back to the ICJ at the end of the month.